Good evening, friends, and welcome to another edition of Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace. We are retired New York City police detectives and 9-11 World Trade Center first responders. Hey, folks, if you like all things true crime related from that police detective's perspective, consider hitting the subscribe button, hit that notification bell, so you'll get all things Duty Ron and this guy right over here, Ed Wallace, when we go live or upload another video. Tonight, as promised, uh, we're going to go over Paul Ferguson's uh, testimony. Uh, we have a forensic psychologist, psychologist, Dr. Joni Johnston. She's a, a, a fan favorite. She's been on with us many, many times and analyzed many, many murderers in the past. And we are always thankful when we have her expertise to come on and uh, talk to you. We're going to analyze uh, Paul's testimony against his mom, the monster, Chandra Vander arc um this is a difficult case and ed and i have been covering it we appreciate you guys hanging in there with us ed how you doing tonight and what's going on doing good ron doing good uh yeah it's hard you know horrific case and now we get you know we did the mom she's been convicted and now we're going to get into the son paul's uh testimony yeah and, and and there's so many people on both sides of the fence here you know um, some of our uh, audience and some of the uh, true crime fans say he's guilty and he's a murderer and others are sympathetic uh, and, and have empathy towards him because they feel like he, too, was living in that household with her and, and, and might have been mind, uh, as I said, mind effed by her and uh, controlled by her. Um, the, when we were in the green room waiting and I was trying to find out what he was uh, telling the criminal defense attorney, what kind of syndrome he suffers from. He said it was a syndrome that where he was trying to, um, had low self-esteem and he was trying to please others. He always tried to please others because of his low self-esteem. So I, I, it's starting to come to me back to what I heard him say. Uh, and I'm not quite sure of the clinical term that he used, and he did use a clinical term. So if anybody in the chat remembers it. It was when the de defense attorney was cross-examining him. Uh, we're going to go into that tonight. We have Dr. Joni Johnston. She's a clinical and forensic psychologist and also a private investigator. She um, has a whole bunch of uh, things that she does. She has her own YouTube channel, which is linked here in the description. Uh, but this case, again, um, when we go over the testimony tonight, it's going to be some really shocking things and really triggering things uh, that we're going to hear uh, testimony-wise, and we're going to play a great deal of it. Uh, and we're going to have our guest um, go over some of the points of this testimony and maybe some of the things that she picks out uh, from her expert opinion. But, Ed, you know, no matter how you cut it, there's going to be people who are on both sides of the fence who feel like he shouldn't even get jail time and should, should get treatment, you know, uh, mental health treatment. And there's others that say, hey, no, um, he was the one who was administering the torture under her, the direction of the mom. So how do you feel about that, Ed? Well, you know, again, even I, uh, I'm on the fence about this because, uh, you know, he has some culpability, no doubt. But he also has a range of issues um, that he's been dealing with. Um, he's on meds. He's been diagnosed. Um, and he's living with that monster. Uh, so there's no doubt in my mind that, you know, his life was in fear um, of the rage of his mom if he didn't do what she said. Right. I mean, and, and, th and that's the thing is that um, and, and when he said uh, to the criminal defense attorney that he was uh, um, trying to please and he has suffered from low self-esteem, depression, and there's a whole host of other things. We'll get into it when the great doctor comes on and joins us. But I want to just say a special thank you to the subscribers. We're at 194,000 subscribers, which is amazing. I, I just can't believe that we're um, you know growing so quickly and it's around the holidays. And I want to say thank you to the replay viewers, the folks who leave us comments down below in the comment section when you share and give these videos the thumbs up we are thankful of that we don't ever take you guys for granted and we love that you're here to learn along with us because we bring on the experts when we it's outside of our wheelhouse uh, ed and i will never speak on things that we are not experts in and that's why we have our next guest joining us tonight but i again thank you moderators thank you replay viewers and thank you for the wonderful classy chat 
you guys are second to none in the true crime um, you know, genre. Uh, when I look at the, the chats and I look at the comments afterwards, and then I go to some other uh, true crime channels just randomly, and I look, you guys, um, because you're paying attention, you guys know what you're talking about. So that's great. You know, so I tip my cap to you guys. Ed, without further ado, you do the intro for Dr. Joni. Okay, folks, here with us, our fan favorite, Dr. Joni, uh, clinical psychologist and private investigator. Let's cool. bring her on in. She is here. Dr. Tol Joni Johnston, thank you so much for taking out the time. I know there's a, that three-hour time well, difference. What happened? We good? I don't know. I just saw the spinning wheel of death. No, we're good. We're good. Okay. Um, I, I see everything. Everything's fine. We didn't listen. The last time Joni was with us, I didn't press go live and we talked for four minutes. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was all great conversation. Gone. Really. Um, Doc, I just wanted you quickly um, to just give the audience a little bit about what you do on YouTube, what you do online, and what you do in your line of work so they get a good idea before we get into the discussion. So I'm a clinical and forensic psychologist. I'm delighted to be here. As you know, both of you know, this is my favorite, you're my favorite, two of my favorite people to be on with. And this is one of my favorite audiences for sure. I always say that, but it's completely true because you have such a warm and supportive and encouraging audience. But so I'm a friend, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a clinical and forensic psychologist and private investigator. And I do a lot of evaluation of people who've been convicted of violent offenses. Um, I do a lot of mitigation evaluations. I do a lot of violence risk assessments. Um, I do a lot of immigration evaluations. So anything where there is a psychological question that might be able to help provide some kind of legal answer, that's kind of my wheelhouse. Um, one of the things that you probably don't know about me, though, is I started out my forensic career working with victims of child abuse and working with families in which there were child abuse. So this really did bring back some, some challenging memories for me. It's just such a difficult case. And think, you know, I just had to revisit some of the family dynamics that I saw, you know, years and years ago. And it's just heartbreaking to revisit those. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, Doc, I, I wanted to ask you before we get into this whole discussion, we're seeing such a rash of um, families, uh, you know, moms, dads who murder their own children, their own flesh and blood. And in the process of that, there's these components of the um, look, we have Ruby Frankie, we have um, Lori Shallow Vallow. They starve their kids, they torture them, they chain them up. And like, this is just people just are just outraged by this and rightfully so we as seasoned detectives have seen everything ed has processed over 2500 crime scenes in his time probably more ed always corrects me on that number but even ed said to me ron i'm triggered by this why are we seeing so much of this doc I, I don't think we're seeing an increase in child abuse per se. I think we're seeing an increased awareness and I think we're seeing an increased media exposure to some of the things that go on. I mean, obviously these are extreme cases. This one in particular is an extreme one, mm. but I do think that we are seeing hopefully uh, more people being held accountable for, accountable for the things that they do. So I can tell you 30 years ago when I was doing this, there was just as much, if not more, child abuse going on. I just don't think there's more awareness. Like I said, I think there's much more um, action that's taken more quickly when these kind of things happen. Although in this situation, clearly not. It results in a very tragic outcome. Absolutely. And I want to get to a couple of the super chats really quick, Doc. And, and you, you, I couldn't have said it any better than that. Um, but the bottom line is, is that it's troubling. People see this stuff. And when we see, um, you know, Ruby Frankie with her kids, they were, you know, emaciated and left out in the sun all day, handcuffed, zip tied, duct taped. It's just utter insanity when you when you look at it. Uh, Sherry Davis, thank you for the super chat. She says one more time. And she must have did this once before. So she's catching my eye. Uh, thanks to Dr. Joni for uh, looking into uh, uh, looking forward to hearing her info and her opinion about Paul, his t testimony and his uh, guilty charge. He, he hasn't been found charged. He's not guilty of anything. He definitely has one count of first degree child abuse, but he hasn't been found guilty of anything yet. But thank you for that super chat. Um, you know, half of our audience, like I said, uh, and, and one half is uh, on the side of empathy and rehabilitation and that he needs therapy and so forth. And the other half is like, throw him underneath the jail. He tortured his own brother, killed his brother uh, slowly. Um, you know, 
I hate to put you into the fire, but I want you to, I want to get your opinion on what you've seen. And I know that you haven't had a chance to obviously examine him or question him. So, so for the audience, it's very difficult for any uh, forensic psychologist or any psychologist of any sort to give um, their full opinion. So these would just be based, based on what she sees, like what we see. But what's your thoughts on it, Doc? Well, I'm hoping that there's an option C. So A is the throw him under the bus, I guess. He's guilty. He contributed to murdering his brother, which he clearly did, I think. Um, you know, B would be he's also a victim of his mother's abuse in a different kind of a way. Uh, and I think C could be both, meaning that when you turn a certain age, you know, he's he was certainly old enough to know that what he was doing was wrong. Mm. Um, he, you know, lied when he first was arrested. He lied about his for his mom. I think he clearly knew that what he was doing was wrong. And I also think that he was manipulated quite a bit by his mom. And so to that extent, I do have empathy for him. Yeah, I concur. Oh, yeah, I, I feel the same way. And I, and I think I said it right off the bat when I first watched this trial. And it was only two days. On the third day, they came with the verdict in 69 minutes. Um, so I said the same thing. I felt sorry for him. He was, he looked frightened still and he's in custody. His mother's in custody, but being in that courtroom, he looked very uncomfortable and numerous times when you see him, when you're staring at our screen here, you see him look to his right. He's looking at his mother who's just over to the right on the defense table. And when he looks to the left, he's looking at the jury. So he does a lot of looking um, and it just, to me, is just just troubling, so troubling. And if anybody in the chat has new information, because somebody put in the chat, I think here it is, um, uh, from S.L. Connolly. She uh, she said basically, um, Connolly, that he he pled guilty, and I didn't see anything like that. Um, Ed, uh, and maybe that might have happened today, but I definitely didn't see that. Um, but if he did, then. It would just be him, him awaiting sentence uh, because someone said sentence the 29th. And I know the mom is being sentenced on the 29th. So mm -hmm. we'll wait. We'll wait it out. So let me put this up onto the stage. Um, we're going to listen to a little bit of this. And Ed, myself, and, and Dr. Joni will be on here as well with you. We're just going to listen to a little bit of the opening because he goes into a little bit of a conversation. And then we'll listen to the defense. I'll let this play just for a, a little bit here. U-S-O-N. Mr. Ferguson, you are testifying here today, and is it your understanding that you do have an agreement with the Muskegon County Prosecutor's Office in exchange for your testimony today against your mother, the defendant in this case, Shonda Van Der Hart? Yes, sir. And uh, is it your understanding that as part of that agreement, the people have agreed that none of your testimony today would be used against you should you exercise your right to have a trial in the, in the pending criminal matter against you? Yes, sir. And is it also your understanding that in exchange for your testimony today, you understand that the Prosecutor's Office will make uh, representations to the judge that oversees your case if such time is reached that you are sentenced in that matter and that you hope to get some sentencing benefit as a result of your testimony today? Yes, sir. And is that in exchange for your truthful testimony today? Yes, sir. Are you aware of any other promises in regards to your testimony today? No, sir. And um, you, uh, and for clarity's sake, you are also charged uh, in this matter involving the death of your brother. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And what is what charge is it brought against you at this point? Child abuse, first degree. And what do you understand the potential maximum penalty for? Well, you know what? Strike that. I want to ask that question. Um, and you are prepared to testify today. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you understand that your attorney that represents you in your pending criminal matter is present in the courtroom. That's Mr. Eldon Brady. And if at any time you need to ask him any questions or take a break, you just let us know. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Okay, Mr. Ferguson, I'd like to start by just talking a little bit about um, your home in Norton Shores uh, at the time that your brother passed away. Um, and so you understand, and, and I'll try to make sure that I ask these questions very carefully because you haven't been present for this entire trial. You have a younger brother. We are not using your, your younger brother's name uh, today, okay? So we're just going to use the initial G when we talk about your younger brother. All right, I'm going to stop this for a minute because I just want you to know, I just put in the chat, I just looked at Court TV, and it appears, it appears that late today, late in the day today, he did plead guilty. And you know what? When I watched this testimony over the course of today, on and off, I got the feeling that he wasn't going to take it to trial and fight it, but I wasn't sure. But um, Court TV did confirm that today. So 
Uh, same day, the 29th, and I, and I guess him and his mom will both be sentenced that same day, Ed. It was hers is the 29th. Yeah, same day, but I don't think it's going to be the same time. No, oh, definitely not. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll let a little bit more of this go. Um, and, and that was just basically the pedigree. I wanted you guys to see him comfortable because he's being questioned by the district attorney, which is he agreed to plea, uh, to uh, give testimony against his mom uh, for, um, you know, so for maybe some type of lighter sentence or, or something of that nature. Um, as, he, but, as he says, mercy. Yeah. He said, yeah, I, I mean, I wrote down exactly what he said. He, um, he was not asking for, hold on. Leniency. He, yeah. He, he said, I'm not asking for, I'm not asking for leniency, but a slight amount of mercy is exact words is exact words. And, um, you know, that told me that he was not going to be in this for the long haul and go and have a trial and try to defend himself because I think he realized with the text messages and everything that uh, played out in court um, that they had an overwhelming amount of evidence against them. So we'll see what happens. Um, so I don't know if this Stockholm syndrome, because people I've heard people talk about this. I'm not sure if that's what he said, but it basically he said he suffers from low, low self-esteem and that he wanted to please his mother. And that's the reason why he carried out all the things that she asked him to carry out. And then the defense said, you have a cell phone, right? Why, why didn't you use, why didn't you dial 911? You know what happens when you dial 911? And he said, yeah, you get the cops. Why didn't you call him? And he, he went on to say that he was trying to please her. But let's let the rest of this play and then we'll get right back in with the doc. So try to remember as best you can that if I ask a question that it's somehow involved, is that right? She's your mother. She's Timothy's mother. She's G's mother. Is it better? Yes. Right. yes. Um, and at some point in time, did something happen to Adam where he wasn't wasn't living in the home anymore? He suffered a stroke in January. Did he leave the house at that point? Yes. When he left the house at that point, then is that then when it became just you, uh, your, your two brothers, and your mother living in the home? Yes, sir. And when Adam suffered the stroke, was he physically able to do anything to provide any care to either you or to Timothy or to G? No. Um, and where did Adam go when he left the house after after the stroke? Um, after the hospital, he went to live with my step grandparents, my in laws, and in their when, house in West Olive. When when did the stroke happen? January. And. From the time the stroke happened, was he ever back in the home in any way? No. And your the, the folks that he went to live with were his parents, is that right? Yes. And they live in West Olive down in Ottawa County? Yeah. So those would be like your set grandparents? Yes. Ron, can you stop it? And sure. Timothy's. Now, I find this odd. She's still married to him. That's her husband. And he, she, he left her house to be taken care of by his parents, not his wife. Right. They said because there were steps in the home and in the, the house that with he, the house he went to didn't have any steps because he couldn't step up. That's what I, that's what I heard in court. Uh, and that was his reasoning for leaving that house. Who knows if that's true, but yeah, I found that odd as well. You know, like he, he, he could have just went straight into that house and not gone up the stairs and, could have, you know, made room for him. Right, Doc? Yeah. And I also thought that it was kind of interesting because on the one hand, I, he I heard the same thing that, that he, uh, that he didn't, he couldn't climb stairs anymore. He was disabled. But then I also heard, I thought that he was in a wheelchair before he had a stroke. Hmm. And so I, I wasn't quite sure how that fit together. Right. You, know, if you exactly. can't handle the stairs after you have a stroke, which is understandable, but if you're in a wheelchair, you're, you're not handling stairs then as well. So I think there might be more to the story than we know. Yeah, I'd like to know how many times she visited him after he left the house. You know, right. if there was any contact at all, uh, you know, between the, the husband and wife. I mean, because they're still married. They mm -hmm. weren't divorced as far as I know. And listen, when my brother um, had um, his last uh, brain surgery on his cancer and he became paralyzed on the right side of his house, he couldn't manipulate the stairs anymore either. So, you know, we, um, you know, changed the the house up so that, he stayed on the ground floor and didn't have to manipulate any stairs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, clearly there are things families do on a regular basis. You have a situation like this come up. 
mm -hmm. they somehow make it where they can, you know, the person stays and sleeps on the bottom floor. They just find ways to kind of work around that. So I, I do think there's more to the story than we're hearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also took a look at his Facebook and some of his Facebook lives that he posted after this incident happened. And he still re said, referred to his brother and said that he passed away. He didn't say, you know, he was murdered. He didn't say, you know, he just said, oh, my brother passed away. And that was on July 12th uh, of 2022. She was arrested on the 6th. So he wasn't arrested until just a short time after that. He made a Facebook live and it didn't seem like he really had a care in the world. He was really more concerned about him and his dog. He was sitting there with the dog, that Great Dane that was allegedly gone into that room to lick Timothy's face. He was sitting on a couch with that dog. And I'll, I'll play that a little bit later. But I want to just play this here because it gets into the, um, the snacking and the food. And I want you guys to hear this uh, in the audience and we'll, we'll give you some, something on that. Um, so let me let this play. That'd be Timothy's step grandparents as well, is that right? Yes. Now, in addition to your to your younger brothers that we've talked about, do you have any older siblings as well? Yes. Who, who are your older siblings? Um, my biological brother, Nolan, um, stepsister, Chelsea, stepbrother, Chris. Um, there's, I don't know exactly how to put it, step, step, Brother and sister, Kenzie and Xavier, I suppose would be the terminology. But biologically speaking, you have an older brother, Nolan, is that yes. correct? And Nolan is how much older than you? Two years. Two years older than you. Yes. And was there a time where he lived with you at the house in Northern Shores? No. Where does Nolan live? North Carolina. So Timothy came to live with you, and prior to Timothy coming to live with you, was it just you and, and G and your mom and stepdad in the house at that time? Yes. So you went from four people in the house to five people in the house in May of 2021? Yes. And then back down to four people when Adam unfortunately had his stroke in January of 2022? Yes. Now, around the shortly after the time of the stroke, um, did there come a point in time where you became involved in having to administer some discipline to your younger brother, to Timothy? Yes. Um, this is where he looks we'll uncomfortable We'll talk about now. some specifics, but uh, we've already had some text messages read. And You see how he looked at the jury and then looked at his mom to the right? He looked left and right. I, I almost want to just put it back just a little bit so you guys could see that um, when he starts talking to him about this discipline. So Timothy came to live with you, and prior to Timothy coming to live with you, was it just you and, and G and your mom and yourself and your mother See? Um, looks over at her and we had those text messages from january through the time of your brother's death in july of 2022 is that your understanding yes sir the at, at some point in time in february there's a discussion fairly early in those text messages about um, blocking timothy's access to food can you describe what was happening at that time and how he was restricted from getting access to food um he was sneaking food that was not necessary at that time. And this is a good place to stop. Solved. Okay. Yeah, I mean, a couple of things just jump out at me here. One being this idea of him disciplining his brother, who's what, how many couple of years younger? Uh, yes, he's got special needs, but uh, you know, we think about discipline as something a parent delivers, um, number one. And number two, the way he talks about delivering this discipline, that his brother was sneaking food that wasn't necessary at this time. That doesn't sound like something a 19-year-old back then or a 21-year-old would say. I feel like I'm hearing somebody who's parenting, parroting back something that he's been told. Yeah, a absolutely. And, and you know, the thing of it is, too, here is we'll continue to hear in, in these text strings uh, about her delivering the message to him to take part in the taking away of food, splashing him with water, making him uncomfortable. And when it gets to the point where we, they talk about this hot sauce, she also goes back in her testimony and says, Timothy really liked hot sauce. And remember, Ed, that gross uh, analogy that she uses when she was pregnant with him? Oh, really? Yeah, she said it started in the womb. Are you kidding me? Really? And, you know, I mean, what, what kid growing up, 
left alone in their house doesn't, uh, you know, take snacks, uh, you know, without, you know, the parents knowing about it. Right. But in this case, there was nothing that this, uh, she didn't know about. She had cameras all over the place to monitor both the 20 year old and uh, G and the 15 year old that she uh, murdered. Okay. Um, but yeah, he'd had to have had growing up done the same thing as the 15 year old taking snacks here and there every once in a while when, when he felt the urge to do that, that that's normal. Yeah. Okay. Right. So that's why I'm saying, and you're, that's why I agree with you hundred percent. He, the mother had to say this to him too, as a child growing up. And, and so he's just parroting what she's been saying all along and, and in her mind uh, is unnecessary. And not only unnecessary, I mean, she describes it almost like, and, and he does too in this, in this situation where it's like an offense. Yeah, There's some yeah. crime that's been committed. Oh, and yes. any of us, I guarantee you, anybody who's listening in, I mean, I've got four kids of my own, as, as many of you know. I mean, every one of my kids has gone and gotten food without asking me or me thinking they're not going to, or they're not supposed to eat before dinner or whatever. Um, and they do. And it's, that's just, a, it is normal. But exactly. that's not at all the way it's presented here or I think seen at all in this family. Yeah. And just like when she testified about uh, stealing the, the Easter candy. Right. Yes. It was like a crime. And the district attorney, yeah. the district attorney here, Matt uh, Roberts, uh, Robertson or Roberts. Yeah, Roberts. He said, what crime did Timothy commit? Why are these crimes? He He kept bringing that up and he was hammering that home to the jury that, it's not a crime to take food. It's not a crime to take batteries apart or to get into things. Um, you know, what's interesting is when I looked at um, Paul Ferguson's Facebook uh, from back in 2021 uh, and 2022, he shows food quite a bit on and him eating. Actually, he, he does live streaming. So he was eating uh, you know, like all different kinds of foods on his Facebook. So if, if the people in the chat have gone over to his Facebook. It's still on. Um, it, it's, it's public and you can view it. Um, and in 2021, he said for his birthday, he wanted uh, people to support the No Kid Go Hungry Foundation or something like that. And it, I found it so ironic. I'm going to show it later on, but it was um, a request for people to donate. Nobody donated to it because I don't think back then he really had a big following. Um, I don't think he has a big following now, but it, it was just pretty ironic that he wanted to, to support the no kid goes hungry foundation. Now, I'm not probably saying it exactly right, but uh, it was, on, it's on his Facebook. Um, and actually, I'm going to go and get it. I think the irony continues in the fact that he worked at a restaurant. He went to work at a restaurant. Yeah. So there is some kind of food that, uh, dynamic here. Yeah. And you, when you think about it, I mean, you think about how, how easy it would be as a parent to control using food. And, you know, you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, psychology 101, talking about what food and shelter are the most primi primitive needs that we have. And kids are completely dependent, especially a special needs child, is completely dependent upon ch their parents for food. And, and so, you know, it, it, can be, it can be a really, really powerful way of controlling someone by withholding food or deciding when they can have it or doling it out or, or teasing them. With, I mean, all the things that we saw um, that in this case are just magnified. Uh, I, right. And she was also a dog trainer and she used those techniques of um, positive reinforcement with treats uh, on the dogs to train. Yeah. Uh, amazing. I'm going to show some of his Facebook here. I, um, this is just, public you know anybody could see this he you know he has his dog this is from 2021 february um more things always hungry warning keep feeding at all times this is 20 december 2020 um just just a bunch of posts of his dog him here with his dog on his shoulders uh and here's the fundraiser that i was talking about um i don't know if you guys could see this let me put it full screen so it says, for my birthday this year, I'm asking for donations. This is April 3rd of 2021 for to the No Kid Hung, No Kid Hung, go No Kid Hungry. I've chosen this nonprofit, and it's um, linked here. Fundraiser for No Kid Hungry by Paul Ferguson. Zero raise of $200, but 
he posted that April 3rd of 2021. Um, and if you look at his feed, you know, there's personal stuff. There's stuff of his younger brother playing uh, T-ball. But here we got food. We got a sunburn. We got the mom with the dog. We got the dog passing away, but more food. The dog in a diaper. When your dog is in heat, you don't want to have to deal with the huge amount of problems. Just put a pull up on him. More food. Him. More food. Um, this is him in the kitchen at Applebee's. He said, when you don't have the money to get a costume, you just grab a tortilla and some cling, cling wrap. And that's him in the kitchen. He was the dishwasher there. This is the mom when she graduated um, passing the bar. And, and again, I found this Facebook page interesting. And um, it most of it revolved around food. There's a shake. This is the, the father who had the, the stroke. Please pray for my stepfather, Adam. He had a stroke around 4 a.m. this morning. The doctor have said that the clot is in order. Um, so more food. Dogs, more food. dog cake for his birthday more food it's okay to make mistakes to have bad days to be less than perfect to do what's best for you to be yourself this is 4th of july this is right before timothy died this is july 3rd 2022 july 6th 2022 is when he died and this is the this is the live stream that after his mother got arrested. This I'm going to play this. Live. Okay. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Uh, hey, everybody. I uh, just figured I'd send a quick check for y'all. But um, we're doing good right now. We're, I just dozed off on the couch unintentionally. I forgot to give a quick check for today. But... Um, yeah. Oh, when I can't actually get in contact with you guys, I'll probably post a quick check like this. For those of you who aren't aware, um, my little brother has passed away, and my mother is currently in the custody of. Well, I don't. I'm not sure if it's. it's I don't know. It's a lot to deal with, but it's a lot right now we're with. doing good. We're we're fine, but. If I can't actually like Facebook you guys like with live because I don't have my phone and I don't know how to access my stepfather's. They had the phone, the police. I'll post a quick check to let you guys know everything's going on. If you have any questions or anything, just comment them down below and I'll see if I can answer them in the next uh, quick check. Yeah, anybody notice how skinny his leg looks there? And his arms, yeah, his face too. I wonder what what percentile he's in given his age and height and weight. Yeah. I'm going to let the rest of this play because it's only a couple more, 20 more seconds. Just keep supporting and pray that the two of us get through this. Pray that the yeah. two of us get through this is what he said. That's yeah. why I had to actually put the um, closed caption on because I couldn't at some points at, at my office today, I couldn't hear it. Um, but this is a two minute and 27 second video that he posted July 12th of 2022. Yeah, and his fingernails are quite long. And dirty. I guess I uh, don't really have much that I can say right now. Uh, but uh, in the comments, I'll leave a little something if you guys want to uh, know what's going on. There you go. Well, I got to go and get to bed, back to bed. So interesting, right, Doc, to see that? Uh, there's just a little bit of research that I did on him. Um, and thanks to some of the fans who put me on to that he has a Facebook. And he's got a, um, a TikTok account as well. But he didn't seem too concerned there, even about his impending arrest. He, he didn't even know. But what he did know is that they had his phone. And that phone, he knew, had 
all of the text messaging back and forth with his mother. But do you, uh, any takeaway from this little video that we watched here for two minutes and 22 seconds? I'm sorry, ask, ask me that one more time. Any takeaway from his attitude from this July 12th? This, his mother was arrested, his yeah. mother died, who was, well, was murdered uh, on July 6th. This is just six days later. I don't think it seems real to him at this point. Yeah. It, you know, it, it really does seem like he doesn't, isn't really taking in the trouble that he's in. And yeah, that he's he still, he's still kind of in denial about what's happening. I don't think he sees the gravity of it. I, I no. think he, I think she convinced him that everything yeah. they were doing was, was okay and was legitimate and was reasonable. I completely agree with you. Hmm. I, I absolutely completely agree with you. I think he, he just doesn't have a sense of that, of like, of like yeah. the, the magnitude and the problem. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's kind of like, he just, it's not no big deal. Yeah. And that's the crazy part. I'm, I was just, I was leaving you guys on because I, I wanted to pull up the court TV, um, the piece of him pleading guilty. So I, I want to listen to this for the first time because I didn't even get a chance to hear this. So let's take a listen. This is from today. Now in front of the judge, he entered the courtroom, he entered with his attorney. The judge entered the courtroom and proceedings began. I'm going to take you back to that moment when the judge enters. So let's go out to that courtroom in Michigan. I think before the court is filed uh, 2022-3537-FH, excuse me, FC, through the state of Michigan versus Paul Ferguson. Are you Paul Ferguson, sir? Yes, sir. Mr. Ferguson, can you please rise and raise your right hand? In this matter now pending, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do, sir. Put your hand down and grab a seat. Mr. Ferguson is represented today by Mr. Joshua Eldon Brady. The people are represented by Ms., uh, Mr. Matthew Roberts. The date and time scheduled for a status conference on this case. Uh, the court's been informed that there, uh, there is going to be a plea. Is that correct, Mr. Roberts? Uh, yes, Your Honor. At this time, it is my understanding that Mr. Ferguson does intend to offer the court a plea to the charge of child abuse in the first degree. Uh, as the court is aware, the court presided over the trial last week of the co-defendant in this matter, Shonda Vander Ark. She was ultimately convicted by a jury of first-degree felony murder as well as first-degree child abuse. I did have an opportunity to speak with the jury after that as Mr. Ferguson was a witness in that case and testified for the prosecution. Uh, I can report to the court that after my conversations with the jury in this case, as well as uh, looking back over Mr. Ferguson's cooperation, it's my intention at this point that no additional charges will be filed against Mr. Ferguson uh, in exchange for him pleading here today to this charge of first degree child abuse. That final decision was not made. However, I, I need to be clear about this until after consulting with the jury and, and certainly getting some input from the jury about Mr. Ferguson's testimony and what that meant ultimately in the case uh, against Shonda Vander Ark. Uh, it's my further understanding, and, and I've indicated this to the court in chambers, that as a result of the cooperation that Mr. Ferguson has provided and pursuant to the commitment that we made to inform the sentencing court yourself of his cooperation, that I will ask the court to impose at the time of sentencing in this matter, impose a sentence within the Michigan sentencing guidelines for this offense. Obviously, that will go to the minimum offense, and then the court will still have to make a determination as to the minimum sentence, as well as the maximum potential potential sentence. But I will ask the court to make a sentencing uh, commitment within those sentencing guidelines. It's my understanding the court at this point has not made any commitments in relation to any sentencing, uh, and that is much simply my recommendation here with those uh, with the recommendation for a, a sentence within the sentencing guidelines, but the court has not yet committed to that at this, this point. All right, Mr. Elden Brady, any comments uh, regarding Mr. Roberts' statements? I, I saw a little bit of questions. I just want to clarify the, the simple version of Mr. Roberts' statement. It's our understanding that the people's commitment is in exchange for Mr. Ferguson pleading as charged to the child abuse in the first degree that the people are committing that there will be no additional charges related to the same set of circumstances brought against him in this case, and that the people will not ask for a sentence above the sentencing guidelines in this case, as well as continuing to fully and fairly inform the court of Mr. Ferguson's cooperation. All right, uh, is that correct, Mr. Roberts? Yes, that's, that's what I indicated. All right, uh, Mr. Ferguson, did you hear the statements that were made by both Mr. Roberts as well as your attorney, Mr. Alden Brady? Yes, Your Honor. Do you understand um, the terms of the agreement? Yes, Your Honor. 
Now, you need to understand, uh, although Mr. Roberts uh, is going to make a sentencing recommendation to the court to stay within guidelines, um, that is not binding upon the court. Do you understand that? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, uh, I have not committed to any particular sentence, and I told the attorneys essentially uh, I'm not committing to stay with even within the guidelines. There's a lot of things I need to see uh, in terms of a pre-sentence report and in terms of some information that Mr. Eldon Brady in intends to offer the court. But I want you to understand before we go on with this plea that there is no guarantee uh, that it would be within guidelines. You understand? Yes, Your Honor. Now, the court, uh, if it exceeded guidelines, all the guidelines are advisory. The court would certainly have to put grounds why it was uh, going outside those guidelines. Uh, but again, um, there's no guarantee. You understand? Yes, Your Honor. All right. So from my research, uh, and, and I'm sorry that we got derailed here, but uh, I, I wasn't aware of this um, before we started. It looks like, it, I mean, the maximum is life in, in prison, but they're talking about the guidelines. And, and I don't know, he didn't say anything about minimums or anything like that, uh, but he could be looking at a substantial amount of time. Um, and, it, and it looks like it's all up to the judge and the court to make that decision. Ed, your take? Yeah. And the judge also left himself some wiggle room there to go below the minimum. Okay. Uh, after he gets the reports back on, um, on Paul. Right. And they're, they're going to, there's going to be an evaluation, obviously, Dr. Uh, Joni Johnson, you, you'll know all about this. And because this is something that, you know, you're pretty familiar with, uh, he'll get in before the, um, before the you know his care and custody in the in the jail and they'll do a, a you know they'll do a full examination on him and see you know what his mental capacity is and what his mental state is and then they'll make recommendations and i think it'll be a collaborative effort between the district attorney the courts and his um care and custody um any thoughts on that yeah i mean <clears throat> trying to think what was i gonna gonna ask you um what were we going to say? I'm going to say the evaluation that's going to be done um, after he, you know, again, he just played played guilty, so they're mm -hmm. going to have to look at his mental capacity and 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 look at what um, what would be fair and just here because Absolutely. again, he, he cooperated. For Absolutely, I was thinking about. I was kind of getting ahead of myself. I was thinking about kind of looking at it from a mitigation versus aggravating things we talk about in forensic psychology. So obviously his mother's role in what happened would be a huge mitigator for him. Something right. that his attorney is going to be talking about over and over again. He's not responsible. She's one responsible. He was following her orders. She brainwashed him. She's the parent. He's the child and those kinds of things. So that would be a very significant thing. And of course the aggravators will just be the fact that he did participate. He participated when she wasn't there. So he certainly can't say that, you know, he was held captive. You, know, you had mentioned this idea of the Stockholm syndrome earlier, which I didn't realize, Ron, what you were talking about, ta what he was talking about. I don't know if you're familiar with the background of that, but Stockholm syndrome, you probably know that was from Sweden when right. these bank robbers basically, you know, um, yeah, held hostages. You know, yeah. Held people hostage. And I mean, that right. seems there's, there's a kind of a, a, a parallel there, isn't there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's a hostage to his mother. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think that is, that really is kind of a, a parallel that becomes pretty obvious pretty quickly. Yeah. And we hear all along in his testimony when the prosecutor was questioning him, which I, I'm not going to continue on with that, but, you know, um, he, he goes on to talk about uh, the restraints, the handcuffs, the, um, mm -hmm. the zip ties that they bought on Amazon um, and how sh his mom directed him to make it, he was, he said, Timothy was complaining that the cuffs were too tight and the zip ties were too tight. And she said, just keep them uncomfortable. Let them be uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, he also said at, in, in the two hour and 49 uh, minute mark in the, in his uh, testimony with the, with the prosecutor that he snuck a peanut butter and jelly sandwich to his brother and scrambled eggs and cheese. And he mm -hmm. said, the prosecutor said, did you tell your mother you did that? And he looked right over to her and said, no, I didn't tell her that. Um, he, he talked at the two hour and 53 minute mark about pizza roll torture, hot sauce, the tub, how he kept his brother in the tub the night before um, from 2 p.m. till 6 p.m. He then got driven to work by his mother on July 5th of 2022, put 
uh, Timothy in the tub from 2 to 6 p.m. He returned home at 1 p.m., didn't check him until the morning when his mother made him get up and then went to check him. And then that was when the mother was frantically saying that he wasn't responding. So the, the, the boy sat in that tub for God only knows how long. And then somebody took him out of it and brought him into that room, the room that they call a room. It's really a closet. Uh, and that's where he was found unresponsive on a morning of the 6th. Well, that's all videotaped, all right? And, and you know, you can say what you want about, you know, he was home alone with uh, G and home alone with um, uh, his um, uh, late brother, Timothy. But he really wasn't home alone because she had so many cameras there and she was constantly watching and she was constantly texting and, and um, inquiring about this and do this and do that. You know, uh, she was an overseer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And she, a, warden, the, a warden. Yeah. Yeah. She was a warden in, in, in many respects. Like you said, an overseer. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there were eyes everywhere. Yeah. And there were mm-hmm. sensors and, and, all, and all kinds of things. So, so my problem is, is this is, um, you know, if he gets a slap on the wrist and arguably gets out in 10 years, let's just say, I'm just throwing this out there. Say he does 10 years, good time gets out. Uh, and is now, uh, 30 years old. Um, do we feel comfortable? I mean, this, I know would have to be up to the professionals, but do you feel comfortable with a 30 year old man now out into society again? Um, and given the fact that he was this vulnerable to carry out these orders. Um, I, I personally wouldn't feel safe with him next to my grandchildren or living next to my grandchildren. I, I, and that's just me. I'm just speaking out loud. Um, you know, where do you draw the line with this? And we, as people that are true crime enthusiasts and, and such, we, we don't have access to his case file. We don't have access to his treatment records. So we don't know really how deep he is, um, you know, how deeply he, he's, you know, not right. And, and my thing is, is I'm trying to, I'm trying to use the right words. I don't want to offend anybody. Uh, but the bottom line is, is he's not right. And to have him get a slap on the wrist, although people are talking, he should go to a mental hospital. He should get after 1974, the deinstitutionalization of the mentally insane. Um, and, and I'm not saying that he's mentally insane. What I'm saying is, is that, you know, in this day and age, if he does get a slap out on the wrist and he is out in 10 years, he's 30 years old. You know, um, I don't know. I, what's your thoughts on that, Doc? My thoughts are that we can't ignore the situation and the, the influence of the situation here. Um, I'm much less concerned about him as a chance to, to you know, to re- reoffend as most people that I see. And I think that is because he was cre- he was committing these acts in such an extreme environment. Right. Um, I'm not worried about him. I mean, obviously, I'm not saying a slap on the wrist. I think he needs he's got some accountability and I do think he needs some treatment. Oh, so I'm absolutely. not saying we should just let him out. But I, and I think there is some some, you know, some justice that needs to be served here as well. But no, I, I, I think sometimes we forget that when we have this, you know, this kind of situation that's so extreme like it is here, that it's, it's easy to kind of say it's the person and not the situation. And of course, it's always an interaction between the two. But I think the more extreme the situation, the, the, the less the person is likely to then reoffend or commit the same crime again. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think he should be in gen pop, uh, gen population in the prison. Uh, I think he should be separated and I think he should be given um, mental health treatment while he, while he's in there. And uh, you know, if he does have a chance at parole um, you know, he'll probably have to go to a halfway house where he should be getting a more extensive treatment um, and reported onto the court um, annually or uh, repeatedly. And then until they make such time, they make a decision that he's fit to come back into a society that he's, um, you know, been taken out of that situation uh, from uh, his mother, and now um, he's come to the real. He'll come to some realizations about what he did and how he was manipulated and uh, why he did it. And hopefully, you know, he can come out of it um, and regain some semblance of a contr- of um, what I'm looking for: the semblance of responsibility and uh, order. I mean, there's no doubt that this whole situation has left a huge permanent mark on him. 
I mean, there's no question about that. And he definitely needs treatment and he definitely needs, I think, a significant amount of treatment. But I don't think he's not rehabilitatable. And I don't think, like I said, I don't think he is high risk as a person. But again, we can. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I'm not saying we should just open the door. Um, See, but I, walk I, I out think, and walk on the street. I think he's going to need some if you know, if he's on parole, he's going to need some very specific conditions of that. Um, and some monitoring and those kinds of things, things we would expect. Mm -hmm. But I don't think putting him in prison is, is such a good idea either, okay, mm -hmm. um, because he can become victim of that environment. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. And it's to be to rehab, you know, to get right. Us, right. And also, it's, you know, you, it's funny you should say this. Um, I was wondering why he is in the uh, shackles that he is in, in the courtroom, the, the, the ankle cuffs and and cuff to the wrist. Is he a flight risk? Is he a, is he on suicide watch? Why, why is he uh, shackled in such a manner? It does that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, wouldn't that just be the severity of the charge? That that alone would. Well, the kind mother of wasn't. Yeah, the, the, during the trial, the mother had no no restraints on her at all. Um, Again, we don't know what his history is while he was in uh, in 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 jail. Uh, he could have had some scuffles with people. He could have gotten into you know some issues. We don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so there has to be a good reason why he's shackled and he's got the travel belt where he got restricted use of his hands. And we just saw it tonight. Uh, yeah. Just made that court TV piece. He was he had that same full getup. Um, I want to play the part where he says he sneaks the peanut butter and jelly sandwich to the brother because okay. the, this line of questioning um, g g gets pretty interesting when we hear him say here. So let's take a listen to this. Yes. Did he ever eat any normal type of meal leading up to his death after you took that photo and sent it to your mother? Um, that day I made him an actual real meal, some an actual peanut butter and jelly sandwich, as well as scrambled some eggs and put cheese in them. Did you tell your mother you made that meal for him? No, sir. Why not? Because I didn't want her to be upset with me. <laughs> he looks you see right that look? Him. You see yeah. that look? <laughs> yeah. He looks I mean, again. he describes this like he is breaking some kind of major law. Yeah. Uh, and his fear. Uh, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. He Absolutely. was to even admit that he did that. And um, he looks very, I, I, in my notes here, I looked, he looks very uncomfortable. And yes, it, 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 just, it just gets worse because now he talks about the pizza roll and uh, that torture and the hot sauce and the tub. So let's take a listen here. Let's move up to the day before your brother passed away. Do you remember the day before your brother died? Um. He was unresponsive when I went to, when I was told to get him up. So you were given some instructions to wake him up in the morning? Yes. Was your mother already up? <clears throat> yes. Were the, the cameras activated at that point though? Yes. So your responsibility when you had to go wake him up was what? Just to do what? To get him up? Um, just wake him up, which normally wasn't difficult before then. But, and this is the day before he passed away, but was it difficult on that day? Very. Um, did you scream at him and yell at him to get him to try to wake up? Yes. And or at some point were you instructed to do something with him because he wouldn't wake up? Put him in an ice bath. And did you do that? Yes. Was he able to, where was he sleeping that night? The closet. So when you went to wake him up and he was unresponsive, was he still in the closet? Yes. How did you get him from the closet to the bathroom with the I ice had bath? to drag him. He wasn't he didn't stand on his own? He couldn't, no. Didn't walk on his own? That <coughs> no. Him? Um was he even talking at that point? No. Did you see how he took that deep breath? Like yeah. he, this is really distressing for him because he's reliving it. And, and um, look at his eyes right now. He's looking at her. Yeah. Look, I stopped it right there, looking right at his mother. Do you remember about what time it was that you put him in the ice bath? Um, not exactly. No. I don't know. If the text message indicated it was around 2 o'clock, does that sound about right? Yes. What 
what time did you have to leave for work that particular day? Um, I was supposed to be at work at four, but unfortunately, due to a flat tire on my e-bike, I had to wait till six for my mother to get home and drive me to work. So from two to six until your mother got home, you were home with Timothy, is that right? Yes. And where was Timothy that entire time that you were home with him? In the bath. In the ice bath? Was your mother giving you instructions on what to do with him? See, it honestly looks like through his testimony here that he knows that was wrong. And he really shows, I mean, in my eyes, he shows remorse. It's not like he's just, when you look at her testimony, when she's asked about these questions, she makes the excuse of that she has the selective memory loss and she doesn't remember. He's owning up to it. And, and again, his statement of that, you know, he's not looking for, um, he's not looking for sympathy. He's looking for mercy, uh, a little yeah. bit of mercy, you know? So leniency, but he's looking for a slight amount of mercy. Um, I, I have to respect that, you know, that, um, and, and again, he did heinous things to his brother. He says, I didn't love him. And, and we're going to hear him say it in a few, in, in about three minutes. Well, I didn't love him enough at that point. Yeah. Yes, sir. What was she telling you to do? Um, make him uncomfortable. And at one point she had me heat up a pizza roll to see if he would be responsive to enticement. Did you actually do that? Yes. And what did you, so describe for the jury exactly what you did with that pizza roll with Timothy in the top. Um, I held it close and when he responded as per instruction, I was to pull it away from him. So you, and you, did you actually do this? Yes. So you actually held a pizza roll in front of him to see if he would respond. Is that yes? Yes, sir. I know it's difficult. Did he respond? Yes, sir. And what did you do when he tried to respond? I had to, or as I was told, I pulled it away. So we didn't get to eat the pizza roll? No. He said I had to do what I was told. Yeah. Somebody in the chat asked, Doc, um, him bowing his head down like that, is that like a, a acknowledgement of that he did something wrong? Is that is there any type of indicator here that what we're seeing is this him, you know, showing remorse or uh, anything uh, yeah. that you would? I, I mean, I definitely think he he does feel bad, I and mean, he looks down consistently. He avoids eye contact. It's like you can tell he's incredibly uncomfortable. Um, I'm just trying to think what, what I can add to that. I mean, he, I think he absolutely knows that what he is doing is wrong. I, I do. Um, hence the guilty plea today, right? Hence the guilt. Exactly. Yeah. Ex exactly. Hence the guilty plea today. Yeah. Um, I mean, oh. I don't think he's pretending unlike, unlike his, uh, um, his mom. Yeah. Shonda. Right. He's not, he's not, I don't see him externalizing a lot of blame like she does. Right. I think he does know. I think he is ashamed. Um, and I think it's got, I think it's got, he's got to be, his eyes are starting to open and think in terms of the environment he was living in and things mm -hmm. that he thought were normal. I do <laughs> think, and, and not that he didn't think they were wrong, but I think he thought they were okay in his house and that his mom, you know, whatever his mom said was how things were going to be. Yes, um, the intelligent lawyer, his mom. Yeah. She must know best. She's a lawyer. Yeah, this has nothing to do with, with in intelligence, right? Yeah, I mean, no, no. I, the level but, of sadism, I have to say, yeah. the level of sadism mm -hmm. and the energy that that she put in a torturing, you know, this disabled child is, is mm -hmm. just unfathomable. It's like, um, it, I almost got the sense that she didn't see him as a human being in terms of the way she treated him. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was using sarcasm. and <laughs> He didn't really mean, mean to say that, <laughs> that, you know, she's a genius or anything like that, but Oh my God. And you know, it, could there be something here? Um, uh, you know, punishing this child um, and even him, Paul, because they're products of the ex marriage. You know, I think there's all kinds of things we could we could hypothesize about. I mean, I thought it was kind of ironic that that she talks when she's talking about herself on the stand. She talks about that she has ADHD, 
that mm -hmm. she has sensory, you know, kind of sensory processing issues. And then she talks about Timothy having ADHD and having sensory processing kind of issues, which one of the things that when people have sensory processing issues, a lot of times are highly sensitive to stimuli, meaning that if somebody's, if they're hearing loud noises, for example, none of us like loud noises in our ears, but if I right. have sensory processing problems, it's excruciating to right. hear loud noises or, or, you know, a taste that might be, you know, aversive to us. It can be even more aversive. You know, there's a hypersensitivity oftentimes system and that she's in some ways, I almost wonder to some extent, um, well, first of all, for, for whatever reason, obviously Timothy, I think became the scapegoat for everything in her life that was wrong. And she just channeled all of her anger into him. Um, so it, could it be that she's angry about her marriages? I also think, and this is going to sound very psychological and it means nothing in terms of her defense, but I almost wonder if, you know, if there is a part of herself that she sees in him that she just can't stand because mm -hmm. the level of disgust that she expresses towards him and disdain, I mean, he has done nothing mm -hmm. that we, I mean, you, first of all, a child couldn't do anything that would merit that level of disgust. I wonder um, if the mother is, was, you know, psychologically or abused uh, as a child. I would be interested in hearing about her upbringing um, because, yeah. you know, go ahead. Ed. And as Joni was saying, you know, um, if she had those things and he had those things, she was punishing him with sound as well. Yeah, I know. She put, no, I know. Yeah, she, she put the buzzers and all yeah. these things there um, mm -hmm. to to torture this kid. Yes. Yeah. Just want to play a little bit more because we're getting close to wrapping it up. I want to just play this and then get your thoughts on this. Worried about him? Is, this is, is a okay defense attorney. Say no. Do you remember that? No. That he's okay. No, I don't. In the text that says the text were to say so. Would you? Do you have any problem with? Do you have, you you seen the text? You wrote. You helped write this, right? Yes. So if, if it's in the text and, and we saw in the text, as far as you know, there's nothing's been changed in those texts, correct? Yes. So if we can point out in the text where you say that. You're not disagreeing with that, correct? No. Do you remember the time when you asked her, we should be feeding him, he's too thin, and she says, give him a little something, and then he just keeps going on after that, back to the old routine? Do you remember that? You if remember that task, text, it's likely true. You show, you sit on that text with the shirt off, and his pants are like pulled up, and you say, Mom, you need to feed this guy, something that effect, right? Yes. And she says, okay, give him something, she gives him, I, don't, I forget what it was. Right. Okay. Just pray. Okay. Just pray. And then after that, did anything change? No. Okay. Because I was too afraid to put my foot down. You're too afraid? A minute ago, you just wanted, to, wanted her to be involved. There's now various reasons. And I'm not trying to excuse my own actions. Well, yes, you are. I disagree. Let, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. <coughs> Do you have a cell phone? Yes. What happens when you have your cell phone? You press nine one one. You're connected to the college. There you go. Did you know that when you were 19? Yes. Did you know what child protective services were when you're 19? More or less. The one thing when we, we just listened to almost an hour and a half of tapes of, of transcripts from your text messages. You did say no to her when she asked you to put hot sauce on his penis. Yes. Oh. But you didn't, okay. You weren't scared? You weren't scared to refuse her? Not at that point. And I don't recall, I, I sat here and I listened, I don't recall any other point where you told her no to anything she asked you to do. You remember any other point where you... We text where well, we can show it in the text where I told her, no, I'm not going to do that, mom. No. From the standing in the corner to the hands on the head, to the hot sauce, to the, to the, the shackles. Did you put, was his leg shackles? They, we found this, this metal shackle, the chain, leg shackle. <coughs> you, were you familiar with those? A little bit. Did you put those on him? When I was directed to. When you were directed to. How many times were you directed to? Quite a few. There, do you, would you be surprised to know that there's no, there is no text where you even discuss the, the leg shackles, much less putting them on him? Would you be surprised by that? Very. Do you remember? Um, let's 
see. Do you remember saying, oh, wait a minute. Do you remember telling the detective that you were concerned? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Is there, as you sit there right now, do you love, do you, do, do you love Timothy? You love Timothy. Suppose I didn't love him enough. No, nope, it's why true. I'm trying to bring bring justice for him. Just a moment. Just a moment. I'll, I'll be... <clears throat> but can I say that I loved him during the time before him. his death? Yes. Did you love him before his death? With all the ways I acted, I cannot. Okay. Let me ask you this: When did you start feeling this way? While he was alive, or after you found out that the way he was being treated killed him? After. So while the time he was alive, did you think you were killing him? No. You told Detective Pisgate that uh, she, we didn't want this. She loved, we loved him so much. That was what I thought, but it's not true. <laughs> All right, I think we get the idea. Um, this is a difficult case. He pled guilty. Um, he he obviously is a troubled individual because of his surroundings and what he had to grow up uh, with and in his adult life. I mean, look, he's 20 years old. Mother was controlling every bit of his movements, driving him back and forth to work, telling him when to do this, telling him when to do that, take him out of the tub, to put him in the tub. Well, he, he was the sole person that was left behind to care for Timmy. Uh, and he didn't care for him. He did what his mother was telling him to do. And it was brutal. Um, but I'll just, I'll just say this. Um, we're always going to have two sides to this. People are going to feel sorry for him. People are going to say he doesn't need to go to jail. He needs to you know, have mental health counseling. He needs rehab. I mean, he needs um, you know, mental health services. Uh, and then there's the other that say, put him in jail and throw him under the uh, throw him under the jail. He doesn't deserve to be out in society. Uh, I don't know where I stand in, in this because a, each time I watch this, I feel a little different. So I wanted to go to you, Doc, for final thoughts on this. One thing that that I that struck me when we were listening to this last piece of testimony that I'm not sure I've emphasized as much as I want to is, you know, I don't think it was just a matter of her telling Paul what to do. Um, and him being afraid. I think that she constantly controlled how he interpreted the situation. I mean, when you listen to how he's talking about what happened, it's like she she framed his, um, you know, his stealing food as this devious kid. This is a bad kid. We have to do these things for him. We have to teach him. She was caught, you know, is for, I think she, in, in some weird kinds of ways, I think she tries to frame this to him over and over again as we're doing this for his own good. We have to teach him a lesson. We have to um, prevent him from doing these things, you know, that are going to hurt him. And I think the fact that she controlled, I think, this narrative over and over again was more powerful in a way. Uh, because I do think that Paul was probably stunned, even though he watched his brother deteriorate and die, you know, right before his eyes. I think he was completely stunned when his brother died. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's difficult uh, to, you know, again, I, I, I'm, I'm unable to draw a conclusion here because we don't have enough data. We're just seeing what we're looking at in court and what we're hearing. Yes. Uh, I, I did a little bit of poking his Facebook. He seemed to be, Again, in that same fashion, he didn't seem that he was, um, you know, up to speed, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, he seemed to be, um, you know, a, a slow talker and and not somebody who is, you know, going to going to tell you tell you how it is straight out. There's a lot of things that he when he speaks, he's speaking in rhymes, uh, and he and he loves the video games. He plays online video games, and that was a lot of what his Facebook was about, but that doesn't tell you what his home life is. You know, we don't know what right. happened behind closed doors. And that's the problem. Ed, go ahead. I, I believe he, he needs to do some time, but I don't believe he should be in gen population with career criminals. 
I think that would only uh, make his life worse and yeah. easily manipulated by these criminals. Yes. I think he needs severe mental health treatments and he's not going to get that in prison. No. Uh, and he, you know, he had, if he's going to do time, he has to be isolated. He cannot be with these other criminals. Okay. Uh, you know, he needs to get his treatment and, um, you know, again, with the closure of the mental health facilities, uh, whoops, Ed froze. I guess that's not around the nation. Okay. Um, what happened? Looked like you, looked like you froze, Ed. I don't know. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm saying with with the closure of the mental health facilities, we right. we, so, we don't have those options anymore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's what makes it difficult because you know, again, I agree with you because I've been in and out of prisons, not because I've been in there uh, as a prisoner, but as w with my work. And when I worked in the trip team, I was in and out of all these different facilities, and they're not an environment where you're going to flourish and get better. If anything, he would get worse in general population. Um, exactly. If, if he can experience, <laughs> if he can experience real love and, and um, from a family that cares for him and he can then juxtapose that to what he was dealing with, he'll, the light will pop on. Right. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. All right. So here's a, a question for the doctor from a doctor. Uh, Dr. Ed Moskowitz says, Dr. Joni Johnson, uh, Dr. Joni, is it possible this young man disassociated during these acts towards his brother, Timothy? Thank you, Dr. Ed. Yes, thank you for that question. I love your thoughts as well on that, um, Dr. Ed. I mean, it's very difficult for me to think that he, do I think he compartmentalized the things he was doing to his brother? I, I think he did. I think he as you were saying, right? He played video games. He, you see his Facebook page. He's, he's loving on his dog and those kinds of things. I think he put all this treatment toward his brother in like a little box and in other parts of his life. I think he, um, you know, just kind of put this in, in the, over here and did what his mom did, and then kind of carried on in other ways in his life. I have a hard time believing he dissociated. I don't know about any history of trauma that he has in his life. Even if he did have a history of trauma, I can't think of one that would cause him to dissociate to the extent that he would have had to, to repeatedly do the things he did to his brother. And he has to, he seems to have a very, very clear memory of all the things that he did. So I, you know, I'm not inside of his head. I haven't evaluated him. That's a very good question. Um, Another good question that's just come up. Is there, yeah, let, you know, is there I, let him go to, yeah. I want to also add just before you answer, this is two doctors in a row. We're getting uh, two doctors uh, to a doctor. Um, he, he carried out these punishments and these, these um, orders from his mom for an extended period of time. Yes. Yeah. And the defense attorney, as much as we hate that, that guy, he said to him, you know, you go and travel back and forth to Applebee's. He's worked in the kitchen as a dishwasher, your phone, you're on it all the time because he, he looked at his Facebook. He looked at his TikTok. He, he actually goes live. He was going live. So he knows how to use these devices. And he was away from his mother for, he said, that he worked until 1 a.m. from 6 o'clock in the morning. So that's, you know, that's uh, seven hours away from the house. He had a lot of time to maybe think and say, hey, maybe I, maybe I could call 911. This is a bad condition. My brother's in a bad condition. Let me call an ambulance and just send a random ambulance to the house. Just make a random 911 call. He could have did that anonymously, but he didn't. Yeah. He didn't do it, and he didn't do it at any time. Um, Dr. Berry, thank you for the question. Yeah, go ahead, Ed. Yeah, we've seen this time and time again with domestic violence abuse, okay? It's the yeah. same thing, you know. Uh, you know, So it's the environment that they're in, and... They don't know how to deal with it. They're definitely afraid uh, of, in this case, the parent, not not in uh, you know as opposed to the domestic violence. Uh, the the parent has this kid on total control. She's got oh. him under her thumb. Yeah, total yeah. control. And and he does make a, a a comment, and I couldn't find it, and I know I'll go and look at it after we're done. But he does tell the defense attorney that he suffers from some syndrome. That makes him, um, he has low self-esteem by his own admission, and that he's looking for, um, he's looking for acknowledgement and wanting to make his mother or anybody in a, um, in a, in a figure happy. So he explains it himself in the courtroom. And, um, and that was the reason why he said he did this for so long. 
Um, so Dr. Barry was asking about uh, institutionalization. I don't want to. I want to try to get it. Um, um, I can speak to that a little bit, um, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So having worked in a, inside of a medium security prison and on the crisis unit a couple of times. Um, so it varies from state to state. Obviously, it sounds like in New York, maybe the, the care is different. I know in California, um, they do. You go to assessment for a couple of months. If, if he is convicted and spend some time, he'll go to assessment for a few months. If they think he's vulnerable to victimization, he may be placed in a special population, which would be a very good thing for him. He may have access to mental health treatment. Um, you can, at least in California, you can request that and you can get it. Of course, it's minimal depending upon what your diagnosis is. Um, would he be allowed to go to a criminal forensic ho or forensic hospital? I can speak in California, unless you were, you know, you're suicidal and you, or you're homicidal um, and you're actively homicidal or suicidal or gravely disabled, meaning you're, you know, doing your, you are, you know, can't take care of your daily functions, like taking a shower, those kinds of things. It is very, very difficult to, to get admitted to a forensic psych hospital, um, you know, because obviously prison, that's not their main goal. Yeah. Yeah. So he, you know, hopefully best case scenario, if he does spend some time in prison, he'll be segregated in a special population with people who are also vulnerable or victimization. He will receive some kind of mental health treatment and then have some very, very hopefully good transition planning when he leaves um, to like a halfway house, as you were talking about, and, you know, get some help that way. Yeah. And, and I hope they do, you know, do the best that they can for him and make sure that he's safe for society. Uh, to be out there because uh, again, what what he did here to his brother mm. is, um, I mean, it's unspeakable. I I, I just I, I can't get grasp my you know I can't really I can't put my you know grab my grab take my head and grab it around. <laughs> I just like so. It, this case just ma makes me go crazy because mm. you look at these the vulnerable, you know, elderly, uh, mentally incapacitated, and the, this kid was at their mercy at both. Yes, right? And Ed said last night, what happened when she comes, when she came home and none of, we don't, we don't have any evidence and any documentation of when she was home alone with this kid, with, yeah. with her son. So it's scary. Um, all oh, right. I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's video of it. Yeah. She has those video cameras, but she, he, he said that she destroyed most of them. She took the SD cards out of them and threw them out on the way to the grandma parents house before she got collared so she was mm -hmm. destroying evidence so she did yes. there was evidence of it but she destroyed a lot of it she destroyed i don't recall that charge being there yeah he he testified to it i listened to it today no i know i know he testified to it but i don't recall her being charged with she destruction and tampering of evidence she should have been charged with that right. i know in the grand scheme of things murder one is way bigger charge but but still. Ed, they didn't recover any of the things he said she was throwing outside the car on the way to grandma's house to grand right. and if it, it based on his testimony they can't charge her with it unless they have the evidence of her you know doing you know getting rid of the stuff so they'd have to go on the parkway and start looking he said she put stuff in bags threw it in a dumpster took another one brought it to another dump like i don't i don't necessarily uh, i don't necessarily agree with that i think they could still charge for that and with his testimony it's eyewitness testimony I, you know that she, she did it and why, did, why didn't they charge the biological father this is a, a crime that happened he, oh, he definitely year. needs to be charged right? It happened over a year ago, Ed. This happened. Mm -hmm. He died on Ju July 6, 2022. It's now. Yeah, why is he getting a pass? We're going into 2024. There's no criminal charges against the biological father who dumped Hey, him there's off. no statute of limitation on a homicide. Well, they should get their ass in gear and, and collar this guy. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I want to thank Dr. Joni. She stayed an extra 20 minutes with us. And uh, I, I really love her take on these things. And I know we got sidetracked, and I apologize to the audience. Um, you know, we I, I intended to play a lot more of his testimony and go into a little bit more. But him pleading guilty, I thought it was important for us to talk about that because mm -hmm. That was breaking news, and, and shame on me, and thank you to our community for bringing that to our attention. The chat was going crazy. Did you see that, Ed? The chat oh, yeah. was just like, whoo, 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 whoo. He, he pleaded guilty, he pleaded guilty, court TV, court TV. So I was like, oh, my God. So <laughs> we got it. But listen, 1,300 of you guys stuck in with us for the hour and 30 minutes, hour and 20 minutes. Ed, myself, and Dr. Joni Johnson, we appreciate your support. I have linked Dr. Joni's. LinkedIn, her uh, Facebook, um, her YouTube, and her book. Uh, I, I have it written down, and it fell off of my 
one hundred and one <laughs> questions. What could Doc, Doc take it? It knocked it's, off. Um, it's uh, called Serial Killers. One hundred and one que <laughs> questions. True crime fans ask. I found it. It fell. It fell. <laughs> These little stick them things. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Doc. Thank, thank you for uh, saving me. Uh, linked in the description, go over and support the great Dr. Uh, Joni Johnston. She is fantastic. She does a lot of different things um, with, and she's a guest on a, a lot of other people's shows. I've seen her around on Police Off the Cuff. Um, she was on with a whole bunch of other different people, Survivor Nation and, and all that stuff. So I saw all of your stuff and I, I'm always there supporting you. Um, you. Yeah. And beh uh, on behalf of Ed Wallace and, and Crime Time with Duty Ron, we want to thank everyone for hanging in there with us tonight. Leave us questions down below in the comment section. I know we only answered uh, three doctor's questions, but we did answer quite a few other ones. And I want to go to the super chats real quick because we can't forget about our supporters. So Shari sends in a $5 super chat. We covered that. Um, we covered that. Bless you, Ed. Bless you. Uh, Kristen, who makes all of our thumbnails and does all the editing and videos for us. Uh, let's unpack that. She says, I can't wait to hear Dr. Johnson say uh, about Paul pleading guilty. And that was early in the show. And I was like, what is going on here? My, oh, the, my, my sidekick who helps me is, it didn't tell me about this. She found out just like we did in the chat. So kudos to the chatters. Uh, Sherry Davis says one more time. Thanks to Dr. Joni for looking forward. We're looking forward. We covered that one too. I'm getting uh, a little bit old here. Senile, as we say, Sylvia, uh, goose, goose, uh, sends in a ten dollars super sticker. Thank you for that, Lauren. Thank you for becoming a YouTube member. Retired underscore nine one one became a member. Welcome. I'm honored that you're here. Kimberly Cope says Merry Christmas, Ron and Ed. Too many triggers. Uh, it's a sick world right now. Yes, I know. Uh, it's it's crazy, Kim. Um, Faded Glory sends in a two dollars super sticker. Thank you for that. And Aqua Aurora Aurora. Uh, became a member thank you thank you for being a member all right that's it ed i know you always got something to say at the end so i'll give you the last one okay so i don't know if we're going to be around uh, for christmas so merry christmas everyone and um treat please uh say prayers here um uh, for all the victims today uh in the in this case uh there are there are not just timothy but there are, are other victims as well and um stay safe stay prepared and watch your six Amen to that, Ed. Um, and, and guys and girls, we I will be live with the members only, and we'll do one more. I'll do one more public probably on the weekend, probably Saturday early, because I'm going to be helping out the missus. Um, I'll try to sneak in a little bit of a Merry Christmas cheer for you guys. And if Ed's around, I know he'll come in. But if we don't, if we do get sidetracked, uh, have a very happy, safe, and and healthy Merry Christmas. And, and a happy new year, because uh, it comes real quick after Christmas. But we will be on the air. Uh, we'll be covering stuff uh, for you guys. Um, but, you know, again, if you're, um, you know, alone during this Christmas holiday, um, you know, dutyron.com, I'm always there. I'm answering emails and, and, I, and I get it right straight to my phone. So if anybody wants to reach out, um, me and Ed, we'll, we'll, we'll be there for you guys. So on behalf of Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace, again, we're going to thank Dr. Joni Johnston for being here. And I want to thank you, our replay viewers, our community, our supporters, we're going to hit 200,000 subscribers sooner than you think. And I, I, we couldn't do it without you guys. So please give this video a thumbs up, like, subscribe, share, and we'll see you on the next one. Peace and love from New York and California. Good night, folks.